So welcome everyone. Um, we're just trying to get over the crypto blockchain kerfuffle that's been going on for months. So we thought we'd have a nice uh, light relief um, and focus on AI, which of course is in, extremely important in, in tech. And uh, we've got some fabulous panelists. Unfortunately, Aldo um, got very ill today, was ended up in the emergency room. So um, we're all praying that he'll get better really quickly. And unfortunately, he couldn't make it. But, um, I'm going to um, first of all introduce Daniel. Daniel is our host tonight with Shepard Mullen, um, and Daniel's a patent attorney. Yes. Only take a couple minutes. Uh, I'm excited to be here. Uh, artificial intelligence is a huge part of my practice. Uh, I'm an intellectual property and patent attorney here at Shepard Mullen, got a degree in electrical engineering. But I'm really glad, excited to be here, and I'm excited about the topic because artificial intelligence has been an important part of the development of technology. And as a patent attorney, and as an intellectual property attorney, I get to work with a bunch of startup clients at every level, working at developing new ideas on how to apply this tool to make new ideas a reality. Nowhere have we really seen this in, this, in any industry as much as we've seen the differences that we've seen in FinTech and exactly where FinTech can go. And that's one of the things I'm very excited. The ideas of finding new insights, of applying these new insights, applying new models, creating new predictable behaviors, in justifiable ways is a huge part of where a lot of the industry is going and how who gets there first is a big part of the holy grail that a lot of us are going for. I get a front row seat to be here at Silicon Valley and see it all, all happen. So I'm excited that I get a chance to be here today as well. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, Shepard Mullen has a great panel of attorneys at every level, particularly in the FinTech space and in the engineering and intellectual property space. So if you have any questions about that, please feel free to talk with me. But you didn't come here to talk with me, you came here to hear from our great panelists, and I'm excited that they're all here. Thank you so much. Thanks, Daniel, and thanks for hosting tonight. And uh, lastly but not least, I'm going to introduce uh, Luz Gonzalez. Uh, Luz actually has been very uh, kind in offering her services for our ICO Watch broadcast and we're doing I'm your weekly. anger woman. <laughs> <laughs> She's getting to sip her wine and tell us all about the latest ICOs um, news and uh, so watch for those broadcasts. Uh, they're being published um, Tuesday or Wednesday every week and we also have a newsletter. If you're interested in um, ICOs or who, what, what are the best ones to invest in or what the crazy news is out there at the moment, um, keep, stay in touch. So I'm going to pass you over to Luz, and Luz is going to introduce the panel. Thank you. Awesome. Well, how are you guys doing? Great. Awesome. We have a little bit smaller group, but that's totally okay. This is going to be a, a comfortable conversation. Uh, my name is Luz Gonzalez, and I am the CEO and co-founder of Convive. It's an artificial intelligence uh, fintech company. We help you make better financial decisions at the moment of purchase, but we're not here to talk about my company or me, we're here to talk about artificial intelligence and where it means meets fintech, which is kind of fintech, right? Um, I'll be posing that question to the panel. Uh, and as I was preparing for, for this panel, I, I, I looked back at the history of where artificial intelligence has been applied to fintech, and it, it really starts with banking, right? Some of the first applications we saw, uh, 1950s, we saw uh, processing auto, automatic processing of, of checks, and then we saw in the 1960s ATMs making their debut. And since then, the the evolution of artificial intelligence being applied to fintech has just accelerated, especially in the last uh, decade. And so that's super exciting. And we have a very just like this panel has a wealth of knowledge, wealth of background, 23 years. Uh, so I'm super excited to be here, super excited to be here with all of you today, and especially to be here with our panel. So the first thing that we're going to be doing is I'm going to have them introduce themselves. So please share who you are, what do you do, and what, what sort of work do you do in where, where fintech meets uh, AI? Start here. Uh, my name is Daniel Madhu. I'm the founder and CEO of SoCure. We're a six-year-old uh, predictive analytics company in the digital identity space based in New York. Uh, we serve a bunch of fintech companies and we power a couple of the top banks, the top five uh, banks in the country. Uh, we power some of the world's largest remittance companies, and it's three out of the top five. Um, so the bureaus, two out of the top three. Um, lenders, payments processors, the gamut. Um, what we do is we apply machine learning 
uh, to combine data online and social data with offline data to help businesses figure out if their customers are who they say they are or not. And we help businesses sign up more good people while keeping the bad people out. So my name is Ken Kwok. I'm the managing partner of Stern Ventures. We connect executives with uh, strategic resources, whether that be M&A transactions or capital raises or secondary transactions. Uh, where I come across uh, FinTech and AI are basically uh, my clients looking for either secondary transactions of $10 million and above, looking for shareholder liquidity uh, and for uh, AI. Uh, I have companies that, uh, or one company that is a client that does uh, natural language uh, generation. Uh, basically, you probably understand natural language uh, processing, which is understanding uh, human language, uh, but generation uh, is what you do when you write an email or what you do when you write uh, an analytical report. Well, this company will be able to uh, take a, synth uh, a synthesis of information uh, whether that be structured or unstructured, and uh, turn it into uh, a professional report that's indistinguishable from uh, others. Great, thanks. Hi, I'm Susan Mason, and uh, I do venture capital investing into startups. Um, I'm the uh, co-founder and general partner at Align Partners, and we focus on uh, multiple areas, uh, vertical domains, one of which happens to be FinTech, uh, we've invested in a number of companies that utilize machine learning and artificial intelligence to optimize the value proposition to the end customer. Um, our companies sell to enterprises only, and then those enterprises, of course, go on to the consumer. Um, but our focus has been primarily on optimizing the customer value proposition, not so much on a, an expectation that every one of our startups is going to build AI tools or machine learning tools but rather how do they utilize what's available. They may have enhancements to it, but access the uh, large data pools that they have available and then optimizing that value proposition. Those are the key elements that we're looking for in our FinTech focused startups. Awesome, thank you guys. So in thinking about where, where artificial intelligence meets FinTech, I was you know looking for like, where, what are these? And so it's everything, right? It's payments, money transfers, wealth management, financial wellness, security, fraud prevention and detection, capital markets, processing times, better data, it's like all of it. So my first question to the panel is, can we in this day and age, and, and Susan, I think you had, a, you had an interesting question that was different from the rest of the panel. Can we in this day and age really separate AI from FinTech at all? Right, so I think our viewpoint is that um, AI machine learning is table stakes for um, startups in this environment today, particularly with FinTech. And it's interesting because the large companies in the FinTech space, and I would talk about MasterCard or even Wells Fargo or a lot of the big banks, they have these huge data pools that and reservoirs of massive amounts of data, but they're not as sophisticated as what we might think. Um, on how to utilize that data. So they're actively looking to partner with innovative startups that can provide capabilities that they have not and will not be able to develop in the time frame that they need it. So uh, one of the aspects that we see, and we talked a little bit about this, news, is that there's just huge opportunity out there in so many sectors in the FinTech space because it is undergoing massive changes uh, on customer expectations and how they do business. And it's not just in the U.S., but globally, we have startups that service uh, many of the emerging consumers in emerging markets. Another big, big opportunity. Anyone else want to speak to that? I, I largely echo um, your sentiment. I, I think um, financial services have always had big data. Uh, financial services also have um, a very highly regulated and governed industry in which they operate which naturally leads itself to silos of information uh, within the organization. And uh, financial services have uh, all, you know, always been a big on automation. Uh, we used to joke in the early 2000s that the world's largest software company was Microsoft, it was Citigroup. Mm -hmm. yeah, they had more developers than Microsoft at one point. Um, so um, I think it's synonymous. And so we look at machine learning and artificial intelligence as an extension of that automation 
And if you think that the world of tomorrow is primarily going to be automated with machines, the one industry that's definitely going to get um, decimated in that process is financial services. Um, human beings are going to be the place at scale in that industry more than other industries, we think. And we'll, 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 we'll speak to that a little bit later. But before we do, um, Sunil, I, I think, I don't know, actually, raise your hand if you're an investor. Raise your hand if you have a fintech startup. OK, uh, others, I guess everybody else. <laughs> All right, just wanted to see so who we have here and what sort of level of expertise. Um, we, we were having a conversation and you, you made a good point. We should have a, like we should understand the differences between artificial intelligence and machine learning and deep learning. These are all terms that are sort of like thrown around. So can you speak to the what are the differences? Um, sure. Um, the simplest way to put it is if you all know what Venn diagrams are. Um, the largest outer circle um, is AI. AI just refers to uh, automated tools to allow uh, augmented decision making uh, so machines can help people uh, make better decisions. And so inside that circle, a subset of that uh, market is machine learning. That's a circle inside. And machine learning refers to the statistical and mathematical, computational mathematical tools they can use to help machines uh, perform those type of decision making things. Um, and then inside uh, machine learning is a smaller circle, and that's uh, what we refer to as neural networks or artificial neural networks, NNs. And deep learning is just a term a Google engineer came up with, which refers to the depth of the neural network. Uh, so that's really the, the distinction. A lot of people throw around uh, the word AI. And so AI has always been hyped. It was hyped in the 80s. It's hyped again now. Uh, but machine learning is not hype. It is actually a science. It's being used across the board. We're just not aware of it. It drives a lot of different types of industries uh, for a long time. Um, and all of the attention we're seeing today in the advancements in machine learning have really been in the area of neural networks. But neural networks are not a panacea. They're not there to solve all problems efficiently. And neural networks uh, themselves from a technology perspective, are still operating on algorithms we created in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. And what's really happened recently is that because of the lower cost of compute, uh, you know, and the ability to scale out compute in, with things like GPUs, vector math is one of the main things in neural networks, um, it's easier for us to train neural networks rapidly across very large data sets that was not possible to do cost effectively 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, so we're seeing uh, a lot of innovation in that space, uh, but they're in specific pockets. And in financial services specifically, um, and maybe we can talk about that later, but you know, it's a governed space, so you have uh, notions like model governance, uh, models that are used in machine learning have to be explainable, so they don't disenfranchise people because of unintended consequences. An example is if you look at the credit score, the FICO system, um, you know, that score basically uh, disallows people from using attributes like race and gender, because the machine can draw conclusions that might disenfranchise people just because you trained it incorrectly. Um, and those type of uh, risks is that exist in financial services. So there are cases where neural networks can be applied. There are cases where neural networks cannot be applied because neural networks cannot be justified. So since it is a broad topic, um, I want us to come down a little bit and, and speak to specific applications that we've seen of artificial intelligence uh, moving fintech forward. So if anyone has a specific application uh, that they've seen that they want to speak to. Uh, so I have a, a company that we've invested in called Juntos. And um, Juntos has developed a platform um, that uh, it, um, really allows customer engagement to be done on a very uh, low cost basis. So they provide a digital channel of communication with the individual consumer between their bank or their digital money provider and um, enables that. And it's really directed initially, their initial beachhead was on emerging middle class um, consumers in emerging markets around the world. They operate in about 14 companies or countries around the world. And um, they bring down the price of servicing that consumer down by 98%. Um, which is significant for these banks because these, particularly international banks, are not necessarily the most 
capital efficient mechanisms for servicing customers. Um, the, uh, the key thing that they've done using machine learning is they have a one-to-one -one conversation uh, of the machine with the consumer themselves to bring them along the entire financial education process of how to do finance, how to do banking, uh, how to do savings, and then progressing them up to wealth management, et cetera. Um, so all of that is automated because they service, uh, I think they're currently now at over 15 million consumers that they're providing that service and it's all automated. Um, so that uh, those consumers have a one-to-one -one conversation with the machine instead of with a person. And that's been a terrific service and has um, saved their customers quite a bit of cash. Uh, with the example of uh, ARIA NLG, Natural Language Generation, um, they helped uh, uh, a weather broadcasting company in uh, the UK that had 600 uh, weather broadcasters writing reports, uh, up to two reports uh, a day for um, uh, for the uh, entire uh, UK. Uh, and when they leveraged the ARIA uh, platform, they were able to reduce that staff from 600 to six and produce uh, six times as many reports for individual uh, area codes or, or, or zip codes. Uh, and uh, they're trying to do that for credit rating agencies, for portfolio management reporting, whereas you would have a portfolio manager spend a half an hour writing a report on a specific client's portfolio. Uh, this uh, platform will be able to generate that report in uh, natural language uh, or human language uh, within seconds for thousands of portfolios. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think there are areas where in the financial services where um, machine learning and automation is probably replacing people, uh, and there are areas where they augment people. Um, so in areas like risk management and compliance, um, a lot of uh, machine learning is used today um, to uh, take, make use of collective intelligence. You know, 10 years ago, you would buy these tools, you would stick them behind your firewall, and they would learn from the silo of experiences that your, your company exposes that system to. But today, the name of the game is not just to uh, prevent future occurrences of things that have affected you in the past, but to actually prevent future occurrences of things you've not yet experienced, right? To predict those and avoid them. Um, so in, in the area of risk management, we're seeing a general shift from batch processing and you know, manual processes to real-time systems uh, using these, these tools. Um, and you know, when you look at areas like fraud uh, and acceptance and manual review, it's a little known fact that a lot of these institutions rely on, on, on a combination of uh, algorithms to make decisions, and then 6,000 people sitting distributed in data centers across the world typing in your name into the internet to find out if you're real or not when the machine isn't sure, right? Um, so you know, the, I, the trick is to try and optimize. So if the machine gets better, then the reliance on you know those manual processes drops, and you get cost avoidance. If the, if the, the systems get more accurate, uh, fewer false positives, then that improves top that has top end revenue improvement because you're able to uh, onboard people more quickly without friction. Um, in areas like anti money laundering, which used to be post you know process, you let the transaction go through, batch it up, and then you figure out if you can see patterns of misuse. Well, all of that's moving to real time including things like investigations, to a point where, um, you know, we used to use brokers and middlemen, now there are robo-advisory services that are doing the, the equivalent. In customer service, there are chatbots that are replacing people. Um, so you're, you're seeing a, a gamut uh, of use of uh, these type of tools across these institutions. All right, so uh, Susan, you spoke to the uh, entire so the entire fintech space is under transition, and then so Neil, you said uh, the financial services market is being decimated by AI. So th these are very strong terms. Can you guys speak to that that revolution, that decimation that we're seeing that we should expect? Susan, yeah. Um, so uh, what we're seeing in the fintech area is that the end consumer has different expectations now than what they had previously. Um, not only the younger generation, but also, you know, 
the later stage generations have more expectations around uh, the real time nature of money capability, money movement, um, the uh, inherent capability of that vendor to understand them. They have very low patience with having to give information when it's like, you should know me, I've been a customer for 20 years, why don't you know this? Um, and that you can see that in the customer support expectations, um, but you also see it in the products and services that consumers are um, looking for. And that ranges everything from you know, your banking relationship or banking account um, being just completely virtual and not having a branch necessarily, uh, and then having complete capability of global tran transactions, not necessarily just domestic, uh, all the way to your insurance services. I mean, things like Metro Mile and that charge insurance by the mile. Um, all of that is based on uh, machine learning around the consumer profiles to determine what's the probability of risk of this consumer uh, relative to what we're going to charge them on the rate. So um, I think you're seeing just broadly across all of it uh, is opportunity for entrepreneurs like yourselves. Uh, yeah, I think Jim Diamond said at some point that all parts of banking are done by million cuts or something from startups. I forget the exact phrase, right? But um, yeah, I, I say that banking is getting decimated because uh, of all the industries where I can see automation displace human beings at scale, financial services is like the top of that list, right? Um, uh, so, you know, yeah. I think banks have always been about lowered cost. Um, there are lots of global banks now thinking about themselves no longer as banks, but as API platform service providers. Uh, they're, you know, some of the large banks overseas are like, well, you know, it's going to happen. Someone's going to do it. So we might as well do it before the others do. Um, so that when application providers are creating some financial service product on the mobile phone, because the branch is actually the phone, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, when they're doing that, and so them having to build up the stack from scratch, they just come to us and license our API and they'll get, you know, biometrics or security or compliance or KY, you know, all of that baked into frameworks that the banks have actually been building over some time and are now just providing services, uh, you know. So you've got that on, on one side of the, the spectrum. And then you've got uh, regulations like PSD2 and stuff in Europe, which I think is eventually going to find its way into the American market. Can you speak to that? Yeah, so PSD2 is a new regulation that basically forces the banks to make it easy for consumers to port their account from one bank to another. So gone is the day where the banks like your client information, my client information is my little silo of you know my precious. You know, it's, that, that's gone because now the bank has to support me saying, hey, I want to move from your bank to some other guy's bank. Um, and so uh, that's actually affected the bank. And then you know we will all use Venmo at some point. In Venmo, when I'm sending somebody money or making a payment, by default, the transaction's public. It's not private. Um, these are you know, emerging trends. Um, and so banking itself, I think, as a business has changed. Um, uh, you know, everything is more real time. All these services that the banks used to provide are changing. People no longer go into branches anymore. Um, yeah, so it's a fundamental, you know, earth shattering change for financial institutions. So I, I think that speaks to financial wellness. And uh, King, we were speaking about robo-advisors and, and how artificial intelligence is being applied to fintech in terms of making the end user experience better. Can you speak to what you've seen? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, there has been an uptick in robo-advisory uh, where they're actually taking market share from actual asset managers who have uh, the real people behind the decision making, whereas uh, robo-advisory, depending on what degree of robo-advisory, they can make 100% of the decisions uh, in real time uh, by uh, machine learning or uh, deep learning, whatever that is. Um, and if you, think about, uh, if you think about the trajectory of uh, artificial intelligence, right, well, say starting with uh, uh, Deep Blue, winning the best human chess player, right? Then you have Waltzen winning at Jeopardy, right? And you would never pit another human against Waltzen again because we know how that game ends. Uh, AlphaGo winning at 
uh, Go, right? And then Alpha Zero beating Alpha Go because they were leveraging deep learning. And Alpha Zero actually won a hundred uh, out of a hundred games, right? All right, now if you think about what is the biggest game on this planet, right? It's actually the economy, it's the stock market, right? Now take a super uh, smart artificial intelligence that has a bank account associated with a stock trading account that has all the levers it can pull, which is buy, sell, or hold, multiply by all of the securities that exist, right? And what if, what if they win? Will you pit another human against the robot, right? And the answer is no, you won't. It's because at that point, um, it will be able to capture all of the value that is generated, at which point you would then pit robots against robots, kind of like Alpha Zero against Alpha Go, right? Um, so uh, to that degree, in terms of robot advisory, all of these uh, financial uh, advisors and financial managers uh, have, let's say, I would say, a limited time before their value proposition expires. That's what I think. Um, I, I'm going to take a, a differentiated view there. Um, so my company, Public Information, uh, we're backed by one of the top 10 algorithmic trading hedge funds in the world, Two Sigma. Right. Um, the founders of Two Sigma will tell you that they made billions of dollars, and then they lost billions of dollars, and they made billions of dollars all over again. Um, and uh, you know, internally in, in Two Sigma, they actually rely more on linear models, you know, good old-fashioned statistical regression, um, more than they do neural networks, because you can't explain why the hell the neural network is deciding what it is. See, the, 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 this is the misnomer, I think, in machine learning. Machine learning is not general purpose. You know, a lot of people go, well, machine, you know, uh, Elon Musk is like, machines are going to kill everybody. Well, he says that because his machines will have to kill people. You know, self drive cars will have to pick who to kill if there's a mechanical failure, right? But uh, I don't think a stock trading platform is going to kill people. Um, in the 1980s in machine learning, we used to have, in AI, we used to have this term called expert systems. That is, um, a machine that learns as much as it can about the sum total of corpus of knowledge within a specific domain, right? Um, and that is actually still true today. We're still we're working with expert systems version 2.0. That's what we're doing today. These expert systems are much smarter because they can learn more knowledge about that domain much faster. That's how far we've come. Uh, but there, you know, the problem with the, the stock market prediction issue, there's so many different variables, dimensions that affect the the trend line on uh, a ticker. That it's very difficult for any machine, other than probably a sentient one, to be able to figure out whether all of those correlate to that the trend. You know, we know um, all of these algorithmic trading, trading funds, they, they go take Twitter feeds and Facebook feeds and news feeds and so on and try to disintermediate. But we're, we're some you know, time away from these general purpose machines that can be all knowing. Um, we're still operating within like, specific silos of uh, information. Um, and that gives me some respite because I know Terminator is not going to come in <laughs> the next few years. Um, yeah. I, I think that you touched on one subject, which is the data. The quality level of the data is really critical. And so the not just the volume of the data, but the quality level of that data. That's right. Garbage in, garbage out, still applies. And, and yeah. so, you know, that's one of the aspects that we look at when we're looking at the platforms that we're investing in is you know, what is the quality level of that data and how useful is it in the um, analytics and the, and the machine learning around that? Because it learns on whatever data you give it. And so uh, it truly is garbage in, garbage out, if that's what you Yeah, and I, I, would, I would go so far as to say it, it isn't, you know, they, it all starts with data for sure, Susan. Um, but you could have access to the same data source as I do, mm -hmm. but your model could have been better because your model, uh, has better features out of that data than my model. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, it starts with data, but it's really the features and the models that you can create out of that data that really differentiates one model from, from the next. I think a, a follow-up question that I have from that, and uh, you, you spoke to this, is where, where should AI and FinTech not go? Where, where does it go too far? Where, where are we 
starting to get into some ethical, moral questions that we should be thinking about. Um, so I'm going to give you two examples. Um, one is called the redlining problem. Um, it is possible to make uh, uh, you know, AI or machine learning system racist um, without ever having race as a feature. Uh, because I could sample data that has intrinsic biases in it, respective to specific demographics, um, and I could train that machine with a target variable such as fraud, um, with a target variable such as fraud, and then uh, that machine is going to start learning the patterns of those people from that demographic with fraud. Next time it sees a person with the same type of uh, pattern from a different zip code, it now is racist and it says... Can I jump in with a question? Sure. How is that better than a person? A person who has inherent biases and... and I mean, this is something... It's an, it's an, ethical, it's an yeah. ethical thing, right? As a human being, we, you know, you can go into Asimov's laws of robotics or whatever, but like we have ethics and we know that just because of someone's skin color or gender uh, legally, we are not supposed to uh, treat that person differently. But she doesn't know that. You've just seen data, there isn't one. So machine can, you know, it, 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 it isn't personal, the machine just seen patterns. So um, that's, you know, this redlining problem is a classic problem, and this is why financial services don't just rush into neural networks, because you can have unintended consequences, reference center. Um, so linear models don't have that problem, because you can actually see what are the features in the model, the rank order features and the weights of those features that actually determine the outcomes, right? So you can explain why the hell the model is going to behave given this type of input data, which you can't do in neural networks yet. Um, and then the, the uh, kind of other uh, issue I see today uh, is that if you look at the traditional systems, uh, the traditional kind of automation, um, it has the uh, net effect of Financial causing financial exclusion, um, right? Um, the infrastructure that these systems work on, and so on, like credit, as an as an example. Um, if you don't have credit history, the entire system that we've set up over the last fifty to hundred years is going to cause you a lot of grief. <coughs> Young people are seeing this day in day out. Um, and you look at this problem globally in financial services. If you live on cash, you're going to be disenfranchised. Right? Five billion people in the world live on cash. And if you're living on cash and there's not enough information about you, how are you going to make risk decisions about that person using all of this automation which presupposes that information being present? Right? Um, so I, I think there are economic uh, impacts, but clearly ethical impacts uh, to uh, the use of these technologies. So I think making sure you pick the right technology for the problem um, and you apply uh, processes like model governance where we know that unintended consequences can actually affect people's lives. Um, you know, I think a combination of those type of approaches and cautious uh, adoption uh, is probably the, the right way to go about it, I suppose. Susan? No, I, you know, I, I think you're absolutely correct. Um, is is the thought process around that. And I think we're relatively early in that. So we're going to stumble through some of that and um, and hopefully we'll catch it without doing too much damage, but definitely we will stumble through. Um, I think if we abstract from that question, um, where do we go versus where we don't go? Um, every time you create a solution for something, it's going to be a solution for someone, right? And you're going to be understanding that uh, target audience or that target uh, 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 entity's best interest, right? And then you create a solution that solves around that best interest, right? What we probably want to avoid is creating a solution that solves uh, around the best interest of its own solution, in which case it doesn't involve us. Sure. Right. And I have an anecdotal story about that. Right? Um, if you, um, so MIT Media Lab asked an interesting question. If self-drive cars have to learn how to kill people selectively, the, the problem for those of you who are not aware of it, in a manual drive car, if you're hurtling down into an intersection at 40 miles an hour and your brakes failed, you as a human being, seeing the kids crossing the road not wanting to kill them, 
are instinctively in some microseconds of time going to steer the car in some direction. And when you make that decision, you're not aware in that instant whether that decision is going to cause you to die, right? Or the passengers in your car to die, or you're going to kill someone else or encounter the bend that you just took or damage property. But you make the decision. So machines now have to solve for the same problem when it's in that scenario and there's a mechanical failure. What does the AI in the car decide to do? How does it kill the pedestrian versus the passenger? What is the system it uses to select that? Uh, so MIT was the first place where they decided to ask the question, are there cultural factors to how cars should kill people? <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting question. It is, it is, it is very interesting. Literally to what you said, right? So they found out in Japan, for example, in a simulation where the car is experiencing failure and the human worker has, the human person in the, in the simulator gets to pick who to kill. Overwhelmingly, like over 90% of the time, Japanese people wanted the AI to kill motorcyclists without helmets. It turns out, <laughs> it turns out that in Japan, people are very law-abiding. I don't know how many of you have gone to Tokyo and stuff, but if you're on an escalator, there isn't an asshole standing in the, in the, in the lane blocking you from, you know, like everywhere else in the world, but it doesn't happen in, in Japan. They're very law-abiding people, so Japanese people. So um, when you give them this option, they say, well, that person, on a mobile bike, not wearing that helmet, well, that guy deserves to die, right? So, so in Japan, when the car gets the option to kill, it has to kill those people. Otherwise, there's going to be ramifications from you know the backlash in that culture. So these are things you just wouldn't know, right? Like, wouldn't yeah. think about this type of stuff, but it, it, it's true. It matters. Yeah. Okay. So um, you spoke to five billion people around the world, uh, being part of the cash economy. We also know that 2.5 billion people around the world are unbanked and 3.5 billion are a combination of unbanked, underbanked. So what, yeah, um, what exciting innovations that, that, that bring in artificial intelligence are you seeing to disrupt these numbers, to make it better, especially for the people for whom financial services and products have been out of reach? I would like to point to my own uh, <laughs> uh, only uh, doing a great disservice uh, as a CEO if I can do that. But uh, no, uh, I mean, um, using uh, machine learning today, we can overcome some of these problems, right? Um, so for uh, the primarily cash-based uh, population in the world, um, you know, the traditional notion uh, which bureaus have used to uh, help is that you'd go enter a market, you'd buy data from banks, and you buy data from utility companies like telecommunications companies who have subscriber information. And these were thought to be trusted, non-self-reported sources of data. And you can use those to create risk models, right? And that's how bureaus have fundamentally grown. Um, but that doesn't work anymore. Uh, a lot of the, the markets are post, you know, prepaid phones, not postpaid phones. People who are unbanked don't have, you know, they're living on cash, there's no information. Um, but one thing is true, um, all of us have those things. We all have mobile phones. Um, Android ecosystem has managed to, to get rid of the old feature phones and give smartphones at all sorts of price points. If you go to India and you get to a rickshaw, the rickshaw driver has two phones. <laughs> you know, uh, sleeps in the rickshaw at night, no home, but he has two phones. Um, uh, so you know, the, the fact that we possess uh, mobile devices, and we now use all these social apps, and uh, we have online presence, and we have digital personas of ourselves. There's an entire uh, you know, bunch of unstructured and structured data in that domain that for the longest time we've stayed away from because we didn't really know how to use it. The internet's 25 years old, by the way. So you know, most of us have presence online. Um, so you know, by now using machine learning to make sense out of that data, to add that data to the traditional business model that the, the Bureau has built, for example, allows you to go resolve these people living in these countries uh, with a lack of traditional infrastructure. Now, there's controversial side to that as well. You might have all read China is trying to create a risk score uh, using ten data from Tencent and uh, WeChat. A little known fact, China was the first country to do that back in um, 2002. I, I hope I get that known date right, but uh, China was the first country where uh, Tencent introduced a virtual currency called QQ Coins, and QQ Coins became more stable than the renminbi and the won. And the Chinese government actually had to step in and tell the social network that it had to regulate the virtual currency. That happened well over 15, 20 years ago. 
in China. Um, so it's unsurprising to me that they move forward to try and create uh, this alternative decisioning system. But we you know, worry about the autocratic regime and what that means with the use of this data. Uh, Microsoft Research a few years ago published a study uh, on Facebook likes. It said that if you just use Facebook likes and nothing else, then to about 94% accuracy per the report, you can figure out someone's race, gender, political leaning, sexual preference, uh, location, uh, income, where they live, income, there's a whole gamut of things you can predict accurately. And their, their summary was that you've got to be very careful with that, right? Because let's say you're in Iran and the Iranian government wants to kill off uh, homosexual people. Well, they can go look at this data on Facebook, figure out that some person is homosexual and kill them. Right? So this has ramific serious ramifications. Uh, the, 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 the data, the, the information we can glean out of this data that we don't think about half the time. Um, careful with your legs. <laughs> yeah, careful, careful with your data generally, I suppose. International trends? Yeah. Um, so MPESA has been very successful in yes. Kenya. Uh, they've tried in other countries with limited success. Um, so the digital carrier, digital money, um, I would say has had some spotty successes, but not widespread success. Uh, which you would think that it would be because banking, you know, every consumer needs to do some level of banking. And um, and so you would think that that digital money would be the best way. But what we see with our companies in the international markets, particularly with the underbanked, is that there is a lack of financial knowledge, just in general, of, you know, is it, what is a bank? What is a bank account? Is it safe? How do I get my money? How do I, if I put my money in there, do I get my money out? Which we in America would think about. But in Colombia, when you put your money in at a certain price, and all of a sudden that currency goes up and down, uh, you may not get your money back out um, because of the banks uh, and the runs on the banks. So these are the experiences that the underbanked and the newly banked have in other regions of the world where there is a lot of sensitivity of trust. And so what you do see in the emerging markets is the concept of the rep who is probably your local store and the individual behind the counter who's actually getting, giving you money, taking money, giving you credits on that. Uh, and that is actually the trusted person where in the US it would be the trusted bank brand. That becomes the trusted person in the local community. Um, so, you know, we haven't solved the digital money um, for the underbank uh, at all yet. We have a long ways to go there, is my viewpoint on that. Yeah, no, I, I would say uh, M-Pesa specifically. Mm -hmm. the, the reason why M-Pesa succeeded in Africa. In Kenya, specifically. Uh, yeah, the reason. Not even other countries. Yeah, sure, there's, there's, there's actually one reason for it. If you walk around with cash in Kenya, you're probably going to get robbed. That's true in Congo, that's true in the UAE. But that's the thing <laughs> that actually, when M-Pesa enter, people are like, oh, I don't need to carry cash anymore. I can SMS you the money, right? right? Um, when we're trying to uh, do digital wallets and stuff, and uh, you know, people want to push digital currency, well, there are a few things, right? One you pointed out. When I possess the money psychologically, I'm like, I have the money. Right. And I'm, I'm not any associated. Time, any Correct. Time. I mean, we talk about fiat currencies all the time, but the dollar is only the dollar worth the dollar because we believe it's worth the dollar, right? right. So um, it can be devalued tomorrow. And according to today's news, where China said they're not, no longer going to buy our bonds, <laughs> yeah, um, you know, it may happen to the dollar soon. Uh, but you know, the 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 notion that uh, we are possessing that currency is the thing that you know, people like, they can stuff that currency onto the mattress, they don't know what's going to happen in the bank, right? And, you know, uh, we've experienced it in the last financial crisis, and we'll experience it in the next one, right? Um, I, I think that that's the aspect of trust that people don't get, and I think why cryptocurrencies fail generally uh, to get mass adoption as a currency anyways, is fundamentally, I think, because you already have so many different ways to pay. You know, I can pay with plastic, can pay with checks, yeah. cash, Coins, you know, like um, I have so many different ways to pay, and uh, I don't think people cordoned on to well, what is this crypto thing, right? It's it was too complicated for people to understand. Right? Um, I think these are the the general factors. And I don't necessarily know if it's a bad thing for people to live on cash. 
To what cash? To, to live on cash. To but see, cash. see, we, we seem to think that credit is the answer, right? If you look at the 14 countries in which credit exists, Japan, uh, Germany, and Australia are three countries where culturally people, when they hear credit, they understand it means debt, mm -hmm. and they don't want debt. Mm -hmm. uh, right? I was in Frankfurt recently, flying into Davos, and I literally had a flashback to 14 years ago because the driver wouldn't take my plastic, and he had to get one of those, you know, put the card and put the paper and the, uh, I was like, hey, you can think, attach a thing to your phone, the Deutsche Bank, and he was like, no, don't trust that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So I think generally in the world, um, that is a challenge. If you look at countries like India, uh, cash on delivery is the mechanism that's used uh, and you know for e-commerce and young people exist there and they want instant gratification as well but lack of infrastructure means they have to put up with cash on delivery but I think the other aspect for for uh, currencies is that if you have that currency cash in hand and you see that the um, the value of that is declining you can easily go and buy people go and buy Pops, you know, soda pop, uh, as a way to stabilize their price rather than have the cash, which is declining in value while they're holding it. Whereas soda pop has an intrinsic value that you can trade across and maintain that value. So it's it's just an interesting different attitude on cash because of the problems. All right, well we're running out of time, so I'm going to make sure I ask all of you uh, two last questions. So. In about 30 seconds for each of you, where, what sort of disruption do you think we'll see in the next five years and in the next 10 years? So just 30 seconds, go. In FinTech. In, in FinTech and AI, yeah. Where AI meets FinTech. Ah, so, uh, where AI meets, so I would have said blockchain will be utilized in the vast majority of transactions in FinTech. That is definitely gonna be coming online. Um, so, um, but with regard to AI is, I think the consumer will see uh, much greater capability and value proposition because through AI, the vendors will know them better. And, and I don't speak of maybe the current vendors, but more the startups that are coming online will provide better services and capability. There's no question of that because we're already seeing that. Uh, I wanna speak to the uh, human aspect of uh, employment is going to change uh, the way we work and intrinsically and a lot of things that you do on a repetitive basis or even if you think about uh, uh, the, in, uh, the intelligence that you put into writing a piece of document or whatever that can be replaced so uh, imagine yourself uh, how would you go about creating uh, a position for yourself so that it's protected in the future um, I think in the next five to ten years, uh, we're going to see changes in uh, what we think of as traditional payment vehicles and payment systems. Um, your car is going to be the new wallet when you drive through uh, a fast food drive through. Your car is going to pay for your food without you having to take out your wallet. Um, you're going to see your refrigerator and your microwave oven uh, become payment systems. Uh, your fridge orders your groceries when it figures out you've run out of milk. You know, um, I think we're going to uh, see this uh, more and more experiences migrate to generate to mobile e-commerce. Generally, I think it's going to move uh, again extension of fintech, but e-commerce I think is definitely going to move away from the web onto mobile. Uh, we can see that happening already with the largest retailers. Um, along with that, I think we're going to see the contraction of entire market segments like biometrics and others which I think uh, are, going to, are won by the device manufacturers. Um, I think multi-factor authentication and stuff are going to be normal user experiences for people uh, and when they're making payments and purchasing things. Um, and I, I think in the next 10 years, uh, we're going to start seeing uh, newer form factors for what we today carry around with us as the phone. Um, I think that we, we're probably going to have devices that combine some form of augmented reality and different types of input mechanisms rather than keyboards and mice, a voice, for example, uh, in ear systems, natural language processing and generation. Um, I think these things are going to come together and uh, they're going to have profound uh, impact on the way we live in the world around us. 
All right, and before we open it up to you guys for questions, the last question I have for the panel is what fintech product that incorporates AI are you so, so excited to use yourself or are you really looking forward to seeing uh, just in the market? Well, um, I'm definitely excited to see uh, frictionless acceptance solutions because I'm a consumer and I don't like friction uh, just as much as the next guy. Um, I definitely want uh, to see more experiences like Amazon Go, where uh, retail experiences are turned from shopping to shoplifting. You know, I just walk in, take the shit I want, and one out. Right? Awesome. Um, I, I want to see more of that. Yeah, there's um, when when we talk about a, a frictionless, cashless uh, society, um, I, I think. Uh, China is actually uh, at the forefront, whereas they have a WeChat uh, application um, to basically combine uh, Facebook, um, uh, Yelp, along with um, PayPal, right? You can walk into a restaurant, uh, click a QR code, order what you want, food will be delivered, and then pay on your WeChat machine. So when I was in China in 2002, that did not happen. We had cash, everyone had cash, right? When I was in China just last year, no one had cash in the cities that I was in. Uh, and we went to some of the second tier cities as well. So that was very interesting. Oh, just a little tidbit, there's an awesome New York Times video that was created that specifically shows that. It shows a person doing basically everything in, in their life. life. Yeah, and like buying anything you could imagine and never touching cash and just like using their phone. I really recommend you guys watch That's it. That's a macro trend, by the way. Uh, if you're a uh, millennial and you're making more than $60,000, uh, you're no longer carrying cash in your wallet. That's the trend going for you. Yo, cash, gross. <laughs> <laughs> Better hope the banks never close. Uh, <laughs> um, so I'm excited about uh, some of the new financial solutions coming along that will help the underbanked and the unbanked in the U.S. specifically. I mean, the, <laughs> the underbanked in the U.S. The amount of fees that the banks charge them, yes. and it's you know the poorest people are the ones who get charged the most. That's right. Yes. You get, you get charged a fee for crazy. being poor, right? Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I'm excited about seeing solutions around solving that problem and, and helping the younger bank in the U.S. Um, be able to, to, you know, not be paying these exorbitant fees. That would be my one thing. I'm with Susan. So just in 2016, Americans paid $30 billion in overdraft fees, and I think the amount of money that people, that just Americans, hardworking Americans paid to, to manage their financial, financial lives was $172 billion. So uh, you and I have the same wish. All right, it's that time for questions from the audience. So if you have a question for our esteemed panel, uh, please raise your hand and I'll rush over. And all of you raise your hands at the same time. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you may or may not be a little bit more on the technical side of things, but I'm curious about um, the application of ML to replacing one more problems or simplifying some of them, let's say. Um, most of the models I've seen there, I mean, they, by definition, they're backwards looking. They're looking at the data that's been produced and they mm -hmm. train against that and all that, which means to me that there has got to be an obsolescence to that model, right? New data comes in, it's different, the market changes, all that stuff, therefore your model becomes obsolete. And, Sure, there's a tendency to fix it with time because new data tends to be better and you're trying to the model. However, it also means that we rely on models that are obsolete with less clarity than you would have if you're making a decision. Um, how do you solve for that problem? Have you seen solutions for those kind of, of issues that yeah. are like less, like, you know, uh, just training the models against other models, etc.? He, he, he actually gave you examples. Um, AlphaGo Zero, for example, uh, is, is an example of that. Um, the, so, so Watson is different. Uh, what Watson did uh, to be better at chess and stuff is really not a general purpose thing. Watson, I mean, the IBM team actually kind of cheated it in Watson. But um, AlphaGo Zero is an example where no human being ever trained the computer system. From day zero, when the system came up, it trained itself. 
As an example, how many of you have seen War Games, the 1984? Some of you are too young to know what that is, but... Okay, well, in War Games, there's a scene in the AT&T NOC, the network operating center at the end, when the world is getting nuked, where they're trying to train the computer to realize that uh, thermonuclear war is, a, is not a, a zero-sum game. Everybody loses, right? And they do that by making the computer play tic-tac-toe against itself in rapid succession. AlphaGo Zero literally did exactly that. So it's using something called recurrent neural networks, which was an algorithm written in 1953, I think. Um, and so what we're doing in these networks today is that you have the ability to brute force uh, a solution, uh, an optimization problem. And the way you do it is you set up a master network with a bunch of slave networks. <laughs> The master network spawns slaves that simply do variations on parameter optimization, meaning I can use five different algorithms and I'll create four different iterations of algorithm one where the depth of the network will be 10, 15, 35, 500. I'll use algorithm two and create another bunch of variations. And so I'll make all of these algorithms compete against each other in brute force fashion. I'll train them all simultaneously, <laughs> test them, and I'll take the ones that have given me the best outcomes, ensemble those, and feed them back into myself. So with every iteration, I'm optimizing myself. So it's a clustering and classification optimization problem. So one part of it is outlier detection, which is I'm seeing a pattern I've never seen before. I have to now classify that pattern, you know, cluster it, and make sense of it, right? And that's an optimization uh, issue. So within specific domains, it is possible to move from unsupervised systems, which are essentially rules-based decision trees and so on, to semi-supervised systems, to fully, sorry, to start with supervised systems to semi-supervised systems, to fully unsupervised systems. AlphaGo uh, Zero is an unsupervised system. It started off as AlphaGo, which was a supervised learning model, right? So that's the, the trajectory to get to that point. I guess it depends on the volatility then. Also depends on the domain and how many variables you're looking at. If it's an open world problem, it's probably going to be a difficult thing to solve. Any other questions? Sorry. Yes, yeah, you need a big centralized Just so data. Just we can do the recording. AI needs a big centralized data. So now impact due to blockchain, which is decentralized. So how are AI going to come into it? It's a very good question, actually. Um, because I think it's one of the areas where the hype overtakes the reality. Um, so you've got two problems, right? Uh, one is, depending on the type of approach you use for AI, uh, you have the issue of how much data do you need? And then you have the issue that in the um, open source blockchain code base, because most blockchains uh, fork off Bitcoin's uh, code base, Intrinsically, the data is encrypted at two layers. One, your personal data is encrypted with your private key. And then when your data is added to a transaction, the transaction processing authority, whichever party it is, encrypts that entire set of transactions in a block with their own key. So what that means is the data is not retrievable. So anyone that starts talking about AI and blockchain makes for awesome hype. It has two of the words that allow the, the million dollar ICOs, right? AI and blockchain. What more do you need? Um, so, uh, you know, big data, throw that in as well. Um, so I think that some things are fundamentally impractical on blockchain, and this is one of them. Um, the people who are trying to do AI and blockchain, they're talking about essentially, um, you know, I'm old so I can use the word stored procedures, which are business logic and databases, relational databases. They call them, uh, the fancy term for them is smart contracts today. Uh, but what they're really talking about is executing business logic in the blockchain in a distributed fashion where the business logic calls out to an external cluster that's actually the machine learning system. So somewhere in the, in the workflow of processing, before the data gets vaulted into the blockchain in a irreversible form, they're pipelining it to an external system, processing it, taking the knowledge, and then chucking that into the into the database where you've got some transaction history trail. I think that's really the pattern, uh, but it's mostly just hype, right? It's not really AI in the blockchain. Right. Okay. Uh, 
Anyone else? I've got a question. Uh, when it comes to, uh, I, I had a front row seat for some of the CCAR actions that were going on, the comprehensive um, uh, protocol analysis review for the big banks. And there was a big concern about creating models that were justifiable models to create sufficient capital reserves uh, for stress testing and whatnot. And there was a, there was a, a big problem with the big banks make, making those requirements. Some of them really did the kind of late one. But it occurs to me that there is a possibility, I just want to see how the hit, this hits you, that, uh, that regulations could be created that mandate certain types of modeling and certain types of information that essentially squeezes out the startup who doesn't have access to the information or the ability to create that model based on that specific type of information. Is there a concern for that right now in the start for the startup world that certain requirements are going to be had that they can't that can't be met with the information they have on hand, or is that uh, was that was the C card actually kind of a one hit wonder that it's going to go away? Go ahead. I've been hoping that. That's <laughs> okay. Um, you know the amazing thing about startups is they figure out a way to get around things. Um, and I just look at money transmitter licenses and the difficulty of acquiring those in every state and all of the regulations that require. And yet you have these startups now that have come up that develop and use sub license their money transmitter licenses to startups so that they can move that much faster. Um, so uh, you know, I, I guess I haven't seen a problem along those lines. Um, I wouldn't be surprised that some entrepreneurs figuring out a way to get around that necessarily. So I, I don't usually see regulations per se. They may put friction in the system, but they don't put a block wall up, is my experience. We've also seen regulation in Europe and, and around the world where they're, they're actually making it easier for, for startups to collaborate and to work with banks and to access the sort of information that's in banks. So hopefully we see more of that. Yeah, I mean, um, I, th I think the, the U.S. Uh, generally sucks at regulation, um, you know, because we're, we're like a slow follower. The way it works is uh, you go do your thing and prove it out in the market, duke it out, convince these banks it works and stuff. And then three and a half years later, when 40% of the market's doing that thing, well, that's the thing everybody else has. To, that's, that's a regulation in the U.S. Uh, Europe is the exact opposite of that. that. They collaborate with the private enterprises they make forward-thinking regulation, and then they, that allows the companies to innovate. I am a person who believes that in a lot of cases, regulation in the US can be a good thing. There are cases where it may not be, but in some cases, for example, having a regulatory framework where uh, uh, you know startups can go and get rubber stamped by the regulators to say, well, this new fangled thing you're doing fits within the box of the regulatory uh, frameworks we require, actually, would spur on innovation because we wouldn't have to go and convince pre-internet people in compliance that hey, just because the law says, US Patriot Act says, you've got to go verify somebody's social security number and date of birth, and I can buy that data to bypass the regulation with four dollars of spend on the internet today. You shouldn't really be doing that. You need to do something more robust. Like we wouldn't have to go make that convincing argument if we could just uh, you know sort of use regulations. But to Susan's point, uh, because of that. Uh, modality in the US, um, you know, all banks have innovation arms and they're coming to us. They're not the ones doing the innovation. Their innovation is M&A. Okay. Yeah, or investing. So I want to thank all of the panelists and Lewis is a great moderator. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you.